here who is one of these students as they have gone through their journey here uh, as undergrads for this culminating exhibition. You may or may not know that these students had to compete between, they had to compete for this show. This show was awarded to them. It was because of their hard work and their excellent aesthetic ideas that they were awarded this exhibition opportunity. They had to talk about their work in front of a panel of three professors twice and um, convince us that their work was good enough to have their own mini solo shows here. So what I want to do tonight is acknowledge our students' very hard work and excellent work, as you can see here. We have representations from almost every area in the studio. I'll let the students describe their own work to you. But I also want to thank you all for coming and acknowledge the tremendous support that you as friends and parents have given these, these students would not have been able to realize their full creative potential without your help. Um, and so we thank you very much for helping them out and coming here tonight. What we're going to do tonight, I'm the timekeeper, and as my students know, I'm pretty strict on it. So you will not be standing for more than 63 minutes at a maximum. <laughs> um, what we're going to do is we're going to have each student talk about his or her work here, and then have a little time left for questions, and then go on to the next artist. We've organized it so that there's minimal movement of folks, so we're going to start. Our first artist that we're going to start with is Leslie Dees, who is the jeweler who will be discussing this here. And then we're going to sort of go on around to the rest of the artists. Okay, I think we're probably ready to start with our first artist, Leslie Dees. Hi, my name is Leslie Dees. Uh, <laughs> Of course, yes, I am the bubbly one out of the group, just to let everyone know. Right, I love the bubbly. Okay, going on. So, I'm a jeweler, and I also do watercolor, and all of my work is based upon my line work, which I have been doing since I was three years old. I have been doing art since I was this big. So, um, I spent a lot of time with my great-grandma, which is a huge impact in my family. She passed away probably about 10 years ago. And um, matter of fact, my nickname from her was Doodlebug. So, I mean, there it is. Um, each piece is um, flowers or some part of flowers, which is based on memories I have of my grandmother growing up with her. She had flowers that lined the yard and we went out and we would water them and take care of them and all of that and we would take each and every bright, bright, colorful piece and bring it in and share it with my whole family. So, of course, my stuff is very flamboyant, and as you can see, my dress is bright and flamboyant, too, because it's kind of how I roll. Um, but, like I said, each piece is, is brought from a memory. So, um, this piece that I have on, um, I made, and it has, it says, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, I will be with you. And in the back, it has a picture of me and my grandmother um, in the back. So it's one of those pieces that no matter where I am, she's with me. So I want to um, thank everybody for coming, especially all of my family and my friends, because I wouldn't be here without them. And I especially wouldn't be here without my grandma. <laughs> Any questions? And <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the medium that you mix the metal with mixed media? Is that right? What, what yeah. do you use? Um, I mix, well, several of my pieces are combined with color, and um, some of them are um, anodized aluminum, and some of them are um, wood. And these are Yes. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about those pieces in my case? Okay. Um, my watercolor flowers, uh, I've been working on them forever, it seems, because I couldn't get them exactly how I wanted to get them. But as you can see, I kind of tamed it down a little bit, and there they are. Um, each piece is handcrafted, um, cut out, and um, each piece is a piece of watercolor that I have drawn my 
line work and it has been printed on my watercolor paper. Each one of them is um, hand laced and with the center of burlap. Any more questions? Nice work. Yeah. <laughs> the paperwork. I haven't made any jewelry out of my paperwork. Um, people have kind of been pushing me to do that, but I'm kind of stubborn, so I just kind of do no, what I you want. No, you stubborn. What do you call the big necklace? Um, that is, it's a, it's just a, it doesn't really have a name. It's just like a wooden flower necklace. Um, I haven't ever just, it's just a memory behind it, so it's never really had, you know, a name. Uh, my name is Randall Barnes, and this is my body of work, the Red Shirt Collective, and it's about a group of heroic kung fu artisans as graffiti removers. Um, so for three years I worked for the Oklahoma City Police Department painting over graffiti and during that time I kind of developed this appreciation for the aesthetic of graffiti removal or the look of it um, as it was kind of layered in these geometric quilted kind of patchwork patterns um, which you can see here. Um, I chose to make my work about heroic artisans kind of uh, in this way to talk about like the path that we're going through as artists um, where we are students trying to learn this craft and then master this craft so then I kind of go with um, like a blacksmith here in this painting or on this other end um, or on this other rectangle you know our butchers and uh, so kind of like the craft in that. Um, the things that inspire my work are where I have several different influences from pop culture to art and art history from the uh, aesthetic exchange between the East and West and kind of the cultural interactions between that that started to take place when trade was opening up in the world uh, a few hundred years ago. Um, and then, so in my work you have a kung fu scene that's kind of painted on this decorative wall it's supposed to be kind of like graffiti, but also um, very pretty or decorative to kind of attract you into looking at it, and it's very layered. Um, these prints here in the, the frames and that are in black and white, those are the story of the kung fu that's going on behind it, and then also there's a story of the graffiti reverse kind of going on in front of it. Uh, yeah, so are there any questions? I could talk about this for days, but not, <laughs> not just like, hey, let me tell you about it. Does anybody have any questions? What's that, man? Who is painting it in the picture? Uh, that is me. So in all of the pictures, actually, <laughs> I am every person. But it's not just because I'm full of myself, which... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's supposed to be the everyman. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you know. What's the um, the purpose of when you open the boxes? Oh, so some of the boxes open here and like here, and they have other prints inside. And those are really just kind of uh, so as like a craftsman or an artist, uh, I just wanted to make an object as opposed to maybe an image or something, and so these are just objects, and uh, they're frames, and available for purchase. <laughs> <laughs> Another one. Do those ones cost anything? These ones do not open, it's just the individual ones. Um, what inspired you to paint this picture? What's that picture about? This picture? This is about, um, so there's these three guys here in it, and this one was kind of injured in this training accident, and they're trying to revive him. Um, oh, yeah, so, um, kung fu movies, that's like the whole thing, these are heroic kung fu artisans. Um, 
these are like kung fu movies from the 70s and 80s, which is like the golden age of kung fu. And um, I kind of came to these through uh, some hip hop music. And uh, so kung fu and hip hop had like a long standing tradition from like Grandmaster Flash in the early 80s to the Wu-Tang Clan in the 90s and beyond. Um, but it's also kind of about this cultural exchange between um, kung fu films from Hong Kong and hip hop from Brooklyn and kind of just that continued cultural exchange. How would you evaluate the graffiti artist in Oklahoma City? Um, <laughs> it's a lot of gang activity and a whole lot less of talented people. <laughs> What is the, the backgrounds of all of those, covering the boxes? Is that paper or material? Or? Um, so this is just a uh, fabric. And so I go to a fabric store and for like one or two hours just kind of wander around looking at fabric. And I try to decide on a fabric. And then instead of stretching my canvases like here or down here or here in a traditional canvas or linen or something like that, I choose to I choose printed fabrics as a way to start my images as um, decorative pieces. What about the boxes? These boxes? These bricks, yes. So these bricks here, these are um, Zillow Pintura, which is uh, this artist, Carlos Colombino. He's from South America, I can't remember the country. But these are woodcut paintings. So here, I kind of combine um, as I planned out my wood blocks, which are uh, these images here in the black and white, um, I would draw on them and kind of plan them out. And uh, the aesthetic of those were very interesting. And so then I began to take that further where I painted on them and then um, also inked up the blocks so they would still have this kind of printmaking aspect in that I cut away the block and also painted on it and printed it. <laughs> What inspired you to do Kofu? Um, the Wu-Tang Clan, which is this rat group. <laughs> <laughs> does the making of prints, in particular these woodcut prints, does this also play a role in your sort of cross-cultural evaluation? In other words, was your choice of medium um, also a conceptual choice for your... Yeah, so... Um, at the turn of the 20th century in China, when the Ming Dynasty was kind of coming to an end, and the um, Sino-Japanese War and the communists and socialists were kind of battling, um, a big part of that were um, prints that the, the soldiers who were actually kind of fighting in this rebellion were um, both soldiers and some of them were printmakers, and they would make prints kind of about it, um, detailing their exploits. And so these are kind of influenced by that. And um, a, a combination of German expressions and like this too. Um, so yeah, there's that other cross-cultural. And I think that's it. Um, yeah. Last one. Hurry up. Hey, can you explain to me this whole flowery situation? Because, yeah, I can't. Um, <laughs> and I'm an artist and a maker. I'm a, um, last fall, I had the opportunity of interning at Universal Limited Art Editions, which is a professional print publishing studio located on Long Island. Um, as an intern there, I was able to stay in the cottage where this studio was originally founded by Tanya Grossman in 1957. Um, this cottage, otherwise known as Skidmore, um, became this massive hub of uh, current artist, artists of the time and a massive hub of American printmaking. Um, in the mid-century. Um, World-renowned artists such as Robert Rauschenberg and uh, Jasper Johns printed at this studio, um, at this cottage, and through that they were able to um, kind of begin this relationship with not only the studio but the people who worked there. Um, and as I was staying there, um, I, began, I began to become very sentimental about this place and its history and uh, thought that that needed to be documented. Um, so the means through which I've done that, um, I started originally with a pinhole camera or a very primitive type of camera where basically it's just a wooden box with a hole punched in the end and the film is slid in the other end. 
And um, with this camera, I was able to involve myself in this dialogue with this area in this house um, by picking and choosing various objects from in and around the house um, and just being able to kind of capture the essence of the place, if you will. Um, so within these prints, I kind of showed this, these dark tones or these kind of heavy vignettes that these smaller representational images are surrounded by. Um, and that is kind of trying to comment on the aesthetic of these pinhole photographs um, that I started with. Um, each one of these prints um, is made with a process called intaglio printmaking, where um, each image is printed from a copper plate. And I actually brought one today. So this is an example of one of the copper plates. And uh, I create images in these plates with a few different um, processes, one of which is dry point, um, where I'm physically incising the plate with a sharp metal tool in order to create line. Another called aquatint, um, I'm able to create these continuous tones, um, for example, in this piece here, um, by dipping this copper plate into a number of different acid baths. Um, one of the main reasons why I chose this medium um, is for one, this printmaking studio well, is a printmaking studio, so I figured prints would be most suitable um, for documenting this experience. Um, another aspect I find interesting about printmaking is this idea of layering. So each one of these images um, consists of actually two copper plates. We're printing two plates on top of each other to produce one image. Um, with this idea of layering, um, these areas of ambiguity kind of start to come out of the images. And for me, that ambiguity kind of comments on the unseen um, qualities that the space around us sometimes possesses. And um, in turn, that's kind of what I was trying to capture from this cottage um, where I was staying. Um, thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Prints of? Um, these are prints of a house that I was living at while I was interning in New York last fall. Um, and it was just a special place to me, so I felt the urge to uh, document it. Yeah. Why do you take pictures so small in the frame so big? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> With the scale, um, I kind of wanted to invoke this intimacy. Um, and for me, that's very important with these images, and it was an important part of my experience. And I just kind of wanted to share that with the audience. Please. Can you talk a little bit about your choice to print on a, a, a gray paper? Okay. Um, the choice for the gray paper, um, I kind of wanted to uh, give this aged effect, um, kind of displaying to the audience and myself um, this kind of capturing glimpses of the past um, and some of it being unclear and I'm not for sure exactly the entire past but through my experience I was able to kind of catch glimpses of it and kind of incorporate that into the imagery and I felt that the gray paper complemented that aesthetic. Mike, can you talk a little bit about maybe one specific image, like the memory you have attached to the one? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we'll go on okay. um, to the Savarin can. Um, this image of the Savarin coffee can with the paintbrushes in it um, was actually an image used by one of the artists who printed at the studio, Jasper John. And so I kind of wanted, and that actual can is still at the house today, so I wanted to kind of encapsulate that and that history by using this can within the still life. Um, the small busts or torsos you see here are actually um, left over from Tanya Grossman's husband who taught drawing classes there occasionally um, when they first started moving in there. Um, and I just thought um, the bus and the uh, can really complemented each other. And so, and it's, a, and it's a reference to the artist or one of the artists who printed there, so. Yeah. Um, okay, this is an image of um, a crate or like a makeshift table that was created and uh, it sets in front of the house, but I just kind of wanted to capture that crate because it, it has such a rich history. Um, there's many photos of the studio and artists who had worked there in the past and a lot of the images are of them working on lithographic stones 
on this crate. So just that crate is kind of heavily loaded in this history. So I wanted to capture that as well. All right, that's all I think. And you'll notice he has work throughout the center here, but he's chosen just to make it to discuss it. Hi, my name is Will Manter, and I'm a sculptor, and I like buildings. So, my work is all architecturally based. I take forms, structures, and essences of architecture, and I stylize and abstract them. Um, I take these pieces and I create them on a seemingly large scale for sculpture, but I minimalize them from actual architectural. So I make them small. Um, with my work, I have chosen to do such what's called powder coating, and so that's what gives them the bright colors. I do this because <coughs> it um, contrasts what people normally think about notions of architecture. Um, putting my pieces in galleries that are covered with white walls or gray walls, um, putting them outside in the grass, um, next to buildings and everything. It makes them contrast, makes them pop. So that's why I do this. Um, I create my pieces from uh, pieces that, I, that are all around us. I take the ideas of architecture from buildings that I've seen throughout my life, and I create my work. Um, Um, the materials that I use are mainly metal. So I've chosen metal because that is the material that gives, gives me the sturdiest ability to create my um, shapes that I want. Um, besides metal, I use wood, I had glass, and concrete because those are the main materials that I use in architecture. Um, for, let's see. Any questions? <laughs> what happened to the glass? It got to go. <laughs> but it's okay. Yes. Why is you painted yellow? Um, I painted this one yellow because it was based off of the Golden Gate Bridge. So it's kind of the yellowest gold. Yes. Um, could you talk about the blue piece with like the wood base? Um, so. <clears throat> First off, I started out with just making all of my pieces out of metal. And so with the addition of wood, I really just wanted to give it a different texture. Um, the metal gives it that nice, just sleek style, but giving it, the, adding the wood onto it, just giving it a new texture, making it look a little bit different. Well, can you talk about um, the decision to show these beads? Yes. So um, I have the beads for two reasons. Um, the first reason was that's how, when I was taught to weld, you do every inch, you do a, what's called a tack weld, and that's what these beads are. Um, then once you do that, you would fill it in, which is called a stitch weld, and then you grind it down to make it nice and perfect smooth. But I chose not to do that. I chose to leave it this way to give it a design aspect. Yes? How'd you glue it together? It's not glued together. <laughs> it's welded together. <laughs> Yes. Where's the cement? What? The cement. Um, I don't actually have a piece in here. Yes. Is your architecture and um, your inspiration, does it come from, like you said, that one's off of the Golden Gate Bridge? Is it all recognizable in the United States or world? Um, it doesn't have to be specifically um, anything specific like that. Like, for instance, this piece, um, the blue structure, it's just based off of a random building that I saw that I liked, and I just stylized and abstracted it a little bit. Um, on the arches piece that you have at the end, um, why would some of those be leaning, and why are some of them freestanding? Um, so I wanted to make it lean just to give it a little <coughs> oomph to it, um, just to give it that styling aspect to it. Talk about your process of like coming up with shapes. Um, so I start out by creating all this work on the computer on a program called Rhino, and then from that I will plug it into what's called a CNC plasma cutter, and that's an automated plasma cutter that will cut it out perfectly for me. And so from that I'm able to piece all of this together, and that's how I get my nice smooth edges. What is 
sculpture in the back based off of? Um, so the sculpture in the back is based off of just a single arch, and I took that arch and just multiplied it and made it so that they're all playing and interacting with each other. Um, I chose sculpture because I really like to work with my hands and being able to get up and move around versus just sitting there and painting. <laughs> Thank you guys. Portraits. The ones in the gallery today all have deconstruction and melting as a similar theme. Uh, these ones here are photographs and there's some photographs on the side. And then there are two oil paintings in the back and the projections on top. And then there's the wax here and there's two waxes there. Um, I got the idea originally for melting when I was working with um, chocolate. I was doing a chocolate cow uh, called 7,700 calories. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it actually was, I measured out as 7,700 calories. But it's uh, dark chocolate and I was it, it was about body image and weight. and. So I chose to I cho choose to use cows and dogs a lot as metaphorical self-portraits because they're both domestic animals and they're both sometimes they're looked down upon but they're you know they're nice animals and they're pretty everyday and common especially in the Midwest and so the cow is um, made of chocolate and I like the chocolate but I I start playing with other materials and that's when I came, found the wax uh, works a lot better and is a lot more controllable. So then I start working more with wax. And then these pieces that I have the most prints of in here, this is called Underneath. And it is um, beeswax on top of an aluminum head. And it's all, I carved it out by hand. And then I made a cast of it in wax. And then after I built it all up, then I filmed and photographed myself destroying it and melting it. <laughs> and I actually, every single one of these in here is just a document of me destroying and destruction, destroying my work. And so every one of them, including the cows over here, they're just in progress of being melted. Um, and then the oil paintings and projections back there are also being deconstructed. And it's really slow, but it's, it's kind of melting back slowly. <laughs> no, <laughs> I like it. I like melting them. nothing will be left. Um, and there's around the corner here is the, what's left of it, but it's just, I mean, what's left of it for me is just a document of the process. <laughs> yeah, it's not really important object or anything. What's the symbolism behind the, the melting? The melting, um, for the, these ones, it is um, sometimes, like, I find myself trying to act a certain way to please people. And so the aluminum, I actually sat there and buffed the aluminum for a long time. And it was supposed to be kind of reflective. So you're kind of, you see a reflection in it of what you want to see. And when you melt away my face or the wax, then all you're left with is the reflection. How do you feel whenever you destroy your own work? Oh, it's fun. I like, I like seeing the, I like seeing what happens. And I've never had a problem with throwing away or destroying anything that I make. So it's kind of fun. I like, I like seeing, it's a little bit random and I like that there's a little bit of, you lose a little bit of control with it. Can you talk a little bit about what gave you the idea to melt a painting or distort a painting and how maybe how you made those videos? Yeah, um, for, originally I drew the, the, or painted the dog painting and he was going to have um, dripping down his tongue and I did the cow too and I kind of wanted them to work together and melt together and so I did them, <laughs> I did them in um, After Effects and I just slowly animated it and destroyed it in After Effects, and then I just have it on the computer projecting back there. <coughs> Are you going to continue a body work with melting? Like, what happens after this show? Are you still interested in this, or are you going to go on to melting other things? Or? <laughs> yeah, um, I want to keep practicing with other mediums for sure, um, and see just what works best. I'm thinking about just going and straight melting maybe the, the clay itself, or I've, there are some artists that I've seen that have they submerge them in water and melt them or maybe breaking them apart. Just different ways to see how I can destroy it and the results. Do you reuse your wax? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took the, the wax chunks that were left over from this that 
that didn't that fell off some of them I put back in and used for the cows And this is my series titled Revisiting Your Childhood. When I was younger growing up, I spent a lot of time wishing that I was older and couldn't wait to be an adult. And now that adulthood's here, I want to go back. So this series is taking my family and friends and regressing them back into childhood. So for example, these three paintings right here are showing a typical child role-playing scene. My sister's in the middle making kissy faces and she's taking the role very seriously. And the guy next to her is her boyfriend, and he is clearly disgusted by girls. He thinks they have cooties and has nothing to do with them. Their backgrounds kind of show that they are immersed in this role-playing idea. The colors are very bright, and it kind of goes along with their uh, role that they're playing. And my portrait right here goes along with them. She is making a grossed-out face that's supposed to kind of pull them back into reality, like, hey guys, I thought we were just playing for fun, not taking it so seriously. And my background has a combination of their two backgrounds, and it's in a pastel color to kind of show that it's not as vibrant as the children made it out to believe. And the two portraits that I have on the end are of my parents, and it's kind of a collaboration of memories of my childhood memories with theirs. For example, my dad is holding a magnifying glass that we played with as a kid, and of course, we never used it to look up small words. We had to see how big our eye could get or how big our mouth could look. And his collaboration of memories is the dog on a shirt from one of his favorite kid movies that he watched growing up. And there's little tiny insects in the back of his background, and he mentioned how they would sometimes set ant hills on fire. So it's kind of <laughs> collaborating both of their stories with mine. And my mother's over here is kind of depicting how I viewed women growing up. They were constantly getting ready and trying to look pretty. And if they ever received news, it was always shocking news. And <laughs> shocking to me. And the items in her portrait are also something that I feel kind of we both share, the old rotary telephone. And of course it's disconnected because it's just pretend. Um, this large cell portrait that I have over here is kind of a comment on one of the many reasons I choose to regress back into childhood. I had a medical event that kind of forced me to grow up rather quickly. and. Viewing it from a child's perspective, you never consider that fertility is an issue. You know, you have this idea women all have babies and there's no problems, it just happens. So that's kind of pulling back into like a, a perspective of women. Um, and on this very corner of the wall, I have two small portraits of these children that are showing off their charisma and their childlike innocence, and they are actually pictures of my brother and I when we were about two years old. I decided to include actual images from my childhood because they stood as memories for me and helped inspire the series. Um, all of these paintings are watercolor. They do have a little bit of colored pencil and acrylic paint to kind of sharpen up the details and bring details back out. Uh, the frames that I used are actually pieces of old uh, privacy fence that were similar to ones that I had at our childhood house growing up and it kind of represents the suburban living that we had. Any questions? You've been very thorough. I know. Um, <laughs> I have a question, which is, you know, looking at these, they seem to have um, an illustration quality. Yes. It's, it, it seems like, you know, that would be a fun thing to consider. Have you ever thought of that, or do the is it just your style? Um, I definitely think it is my style. I really, I don't know, I like how animated it looks, and I felt like it fit with the theme that I was trying to portray, too, as well. Have you thought about after school? What are you going to do? Um, my plan is to take a year off and work on more art and then apply for graduate schools and continue art education. That was my question. Oh, was it? <laughs> okay. Are you going to continue with this same theme or are yes. you? Yes. 
I plan on doing the recreating childhood only. I plan on going to a larger scale and actually putting these figures in like a setting, like sitting at a preschooler table, to where it looks really awkward and like they don't belong. So that's where the series is going next. Any other questions? Stephanie, I noticed that at least some of your models are here this evening. I wonder if you've got any feedback about these very flattering portraits. <laughs> um, yes, they are all here tonight. They are my family. Um, I try not to be too concerned with their feedback. <laughs> but it's definitely my glimpse of the things that I love that stuff and how silly and playful they are. So hopefully it's flattering to them. So. <laughs> Thank you. My artwork and to the right, I use watercolors to paint abstract landscapes. Where I find my motivation comes from my family and how I was raised. Uh, there's a deep respect for Mother Nature. And <clears throat> it is very important to me and to my work. Um, I had spent three years working for the Tulsa Zoo Horticulture Department as a seasonal gardener. I was a whitewater guide in West Virginia, so a lot of that has directly impacted my work. And also I've traveled the United States as an avid camper and a hiker, so I get a lot of my information from there through photographs. I begin my process uh, on a three, 100 to 300 pound watercolor paper. I start with an HB pencil and I just begin drawing um, pretty much spontaneous shapes. I don't have a preconceived notion as to what habitat I'm going to create. So I start kind of just free flowing and then I begin to implement shapes and forms that look like feathers, grass, water, snails, etc. Um, after the entire composition is complete, I start thinking about the colors I want to use. Uh, earth tones obviously play a big role in my work because I am depicting the outdoors. So um, you will uh, you'll see a lot of greens, browns, and blues, but I also experiment with other colors. So I like to add in a little bit of red or an aqua blue or an orange, and color for me is something I continuously have a challenge with and have a lot of fun with. So. Um, these are my overall pieces, and what I kind of hope that people get from them is a, a reinvention of the outdoors, like to see their everyday world presented in a different way. Um, a lot of times the environment is taken for granted. So with my abstract renditions, I hope that it spurs the viewer's imagination. And that's kind of the totality of my spiel. So, would anyone like to ask me a question? No, I love teaching very much. In fact, my students are, were very apt to ask me, why aren't you teaching art also? So, they, they actually helped influence me to come back to school. Yes. Yes, Angie. When you are thinking about space in your paintings, I just I noticed each one has a really different sort of spatial feel. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you decide which one to do or what you're thinking about? Yeah, yeah when I start, um, a lot of times I, I will start at the bottom of a piece of the composition and kind of build my way up with layers. Um, a lot of times I do struggle once I get towards the top with, am I going to leave this open? Am I going to fill it in completely? I, I like the fact with all of these pieces that they kind of envelop you and you get kind of an intimate experience and kind of feel like you're part of it. Yes? Does teaching English feed into this, a narrative or a structure? Um, maybe on a philosophical level, but not directly. So, anybody else? All right. Oh. How did you? How, how how is it that you've landed on watercolors your medium as opposed to any other aqua media or any other? Good question. I have chosen watercolor. Uh, there's two reasons. Number one, for me, 
Um, I try to show or give the illusion of movement within my pieces and the transparent quality of watercolor benefits uh, the shapes. I also like watercolor because it's kind of environmentally safe. So, but I will do other things again, but yeah, so. All right, thank you very much. I'm Paxton Capen. Um, my current body of work collection of recollections um, has to do with the different relationships in my life. Each piece is about what matters most to me, the relationships that I have with my friends and family. These watercolors are meant to be snapshots of the different moments um, in the relationships, whether they be good moments or bad moments. Each painting starts out as a pencil drawing of the figure, which is then outlined in ink. I then apply a wash of one to two colors, and then I add salt. I use a mixture of rock salt and table salt, and the salt creates a starburst effect that is seen in the backgrounds. Each color reacts differently to the salt, so I never know what to expect. After the salt resist is dry, I draw in the patterns and fill in the ink and the color to the figures. Um, as you can see, I depict numerous types of relationships. If you're looking at the wall, you can see a parent and child, you can see siblings, families, lovers, and even oneself. Um, the patterns within the figure symbolize their personalities. For instance, in Afternoon with Woody right here, um, which is a depiction of a dog attack that I experienced last summer, Woody the dog is drawn in with polka dots because I was told that he was a friendly dog. The jagged edges suggest that he was not. <laughs> um, from the very beginning, I knew that I wanted to hang these salon style so that they resembled a family portrait wall. And the size and the shape of each painting was chosen with that in mind. While creating these pieces, it was very important to me that I draw upon my personal experiences, but that my viewers could also place themselves within the paintings and imagine their own relationships. I've chosen to illustrate the enjoyable moments and the not so enjoyable moments because I think that it allows the viewer to see all aspects of the relationship. So whether it is a parent lecturing a child or two lovers embracing, the memories are important. Any questions? Yes. Uh, why are the parents' heads cut off in the family portrait here? <laughs> <laughs> um, this one is actually supposed to be kind of a comedy of um, when my family takes portraits, it's always a bigger job than it really should be. So there's always a kid who has their eye cl eyes closed and the person that's wondering. And so that one is kind of the real family portrait of how it really should turn out if we took the appropriate amount of time for it. <laughs> Any other questions? you talked a little bit about the variable shapes and the way you arranged them on the wall. Yes. Um, so I've chosen to have circles and ovals and squares and rectangles and um, display them in this style that is not traditional to a gallery because in both of my grandparents' homes there are huge picture walls and I just remember there's just random photos and you could just tell so much about different people by looking at these walls. Um, and typically they have the good moments but sometimes they had funny candidates and things on them as well. Can you talk about a little bit about this piece? I noticed that one's quite different than there's no figures per se in it, so. Yes, um, and there actually is a figure. It's wrapped around the heart, so it's kind of disguised. Um, this was actually the very first piece that I did, so it started the whole series, and there's probably 15 to 20 paintings in between this painting and Afternoon with Woody that didn't make it onto the wall. And um, this painting kind of encapsulates the whole show. My relationships are what I hold dear to my heart, and um, that is kind of what this painting is about. It's called Hold On Tight. So. You've made some choices to extend your drawings onto the mats of your um, pieces. That's unusual. Can you talk about that choice? Yes. Um, it was purely a design choice. Um, when these started out, um, just as in this one, they didn't have a border at all. So then we decided that they needed something to make them pop. So I started drawing frames actually on the paper with different patterns inside them. It wasn't working at all. And so we went to a different idea. And I was drawing um, patterns on the mat. One day I walked into critique and I didn't have everything finished and I had just the limbs drawn on. And we looked at it and we said, I really think that looks great, don't you? And I said yes and then everyone in the critique agreed and it's just moved on since then. 
what uh, scale means in numerics? Like the scale system? Yes. Um, so, in, for example, in this one titled Vows, um, the figure is massive compared to the people. Um, and I actually loved last November. And um, so this kind of symbolizes that process. This is supposed to be the justice who had bright green hair. And um, it just was this big moment. And we just seemed so small, but we were there. Um, so the scale kind of reflects kind of the tone of each piece and um, my feelings towards how that moment was. Yes? Why are their heads hovering? I'm sorry? Why are their heads hovering? That was purely a design choice as well. Um, we started as sketches, and I just never gave them necks. So um, I guess going in the future, I can experiment with that. But um, I really like them just hovering. So. <laughs> I use photo, uh, acrylic photo transfer and oil washes to get a really nice nostalgic feel with each piece. And within each piece, um, I try to work with space to kind of get an emotional connection, um, or I hope that I'm getting an emotional connection um, for the viewer. As far as the reason I came up with this, I'm the type of person, my memories are always floating around and coming up to me. Um, so I really just thought, well, why not use that in your artwork and see what happens. And so far, I've really enjoyed the series. I plan on moving forward, forward, forward with the series, and um, I hope everyone's enjoying it as well. Is there any questions or any information I can give, give you about my work? Oh, okay. Um, I've been told to talk about some individually, so uh, I'm going to start with one that I keep getting questions over and people really like, which is the frog um, painting. Uh, the frog painting has several different meanings. Um, first of all, I'm extremely afraid of frogs, so I'll start there. Um, I grew up, first of all, I grew up in a very small town in Oklahoma, and I was extremely poor, and I'm talking more poor. Um, so frogs would plague me often in my house. And so, honestly, I remember taking a bath and just thinking all the time, frogs were going to come and attack me, so that's sort of how that came to be. And, um, <laughs> I don't know if anyone has any more questions over that one, but that is kind of the short story for that. Um, this one actually is kind of close to my heart, too, The Cheaters Never Win. Um, it's kind of a story about me and my sister, and I, um, when I was a little kid, there was a, a, a drawing contest, or a, a coloring contest at the local Sonic, and I was very excited. I, it was my first thing I wanted to enter, had a, a drawing of a um, witch that you got to color in, and I'm a huge fan of witches, so I thought, okay, you know, I really want to do this. I talked my sister in to go get me the paper. So I'm coloring, and I got really creative, and I was really outside of the lines, and I might have made some, like, stripes on her, her tights and all that stuff. And my sister said, Sissy, do you think you really want to turn that one in? And I said, well, I mean, I thought it looks good. But then, you know, <laughs> then she says, oh, how about I'll get you another one? So she came and got me another piece of paper, and I started um, coloring. She goes, well, let me show you how to color inside the lines. And she also showed me the colors to use. And I, I started seeing her work, and I thought, well, her work's way better than what I'm doing here. So I sort of let her finish it up. And then she held them both up. Which one do you want to turn in? And I was like, the well, one that's going to win. Are you crazy? So, so we turned it in. And uh, the prize, the first prize, was actually uh, strawberry shortcake figurines. And I really desperately wanted them. Um, but the kid that got in second, got upset because they weren't getting the strawberry shortcake things too. So they had like a little talk, they all had a talk, and they ended up giving me the teddy bear, which was second place. And the kid, the other prize, so hence the name, Cheaters Never Win. You know, I love the story there. I learned a very good lesson there. So, um, yeah, and any questions that I can answer for you at this time or comments on anything? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the whole reason I started doing um, the acrylic photo transfer is because I wanted a certain effect to the paintings. And I decided once I was I started doing them, I really liked to make them look a little torn, a little worn, like a picture, an old picture would be. Um, and also in representing, you know, it's in the past. It's my memory. It was my perception. 
So, and I really, you know, I really use that um, heavily when I say my perception because my sister or my other siblings, mother, father, they might not have seen this uh, event quite the same. And I thought, I thought that would um, come across if I did that. So. <laughs> Um, a lot of the color choices I make is just I want a certain mood for a picture, so that's kind of how it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, so my all my holiday moments. Um, my fans gonna love this. Um, well, really, it was like growing up, or you know that really it's a struggle. Like a lot of people have struggles. Um, you know, to make the holidays work and everything. And my parents worked really hard to try to do what they could. Um, the Easter one, I really felt like I remember looking back and I loved Easter. I got a new dress at Easter. Um, got to be creative, color the eggs and everything. But what I realized looking back is that I was the last kid out of five kids and nobody wanted to go hide Easter eggs for me. You know, like everybody's like, oh, it's time. We got to go out there and hide Easter eggs. So it was sort of just my perception of how it was. And, and um, Christmas was like that too, you know? I mean, there were years that we really didn't get a whole lot of gifts. And I remember we would have some sort of tree up, and um, if we had a tree, and it would just be like, you'd be sort of set, sitting around it. I remember looking at it thinking it was sort of magic. Like that was the whole purpose of Christmas was the tree, you know, so.